In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Before I dive into what I'm sure is to be too heady of a, of, of a sermon on too heady of a subject, that is the Holy Trinity, um, I do want to just uh, highlight uh, a piece within the gospel uh, itself. Uh, and that is the, the relationship and interchange between Jesus and Nicodemus. Uh, we are often, many of us have probably been raised with the idea that to, to have faith is to, to, um, to, to, to not question the fundamentals of faith. To not question something as uh, substantive and as fundamental as the Trinity. To not uh, raise our questions to uh, discussion or to a priest's ear to just receive these mysteries. Um, and so we can look to the relationship that we've just seen between Jesus and Nicodemus to see how God responds to inquiry, to um, the confusion of the human heart and mind, or the uncertainty, one might say. Remembering that Nicodemus is a great teacher within uh, the Pharisaic movement, uh, within, and within all, within all of Israel. And even he has questions. And you'll notice that Jesus honors those questions, receives them, engages them, and invites them even. For it is our questions that lead us into deeper faith. It is the exploration of the question that brings us to understanding and through understanding, perhaps, to transformation of life. And so whatever questions you may have, be it about the Trinity, for we all have those, or any other subject of, of, or matter of faith, know that those questions are important and that we're invited to bring them either to our conversation, our dialogue through prayer with God, or with one another. As I said, that was just an aside uh, for our reading, and so I wish to turn our attention uh, to that which is at hand, and it is the mystery of of the Holy Trinity. It's even noted in the collect that this is a mystery, as our, uh, as our collect writer puts it. And in the power of your divine majesty, we worship the unity. It is an unknown, isn't it? Every preacher on this Sunday is probably making note of that singular reality that this subject is one of mystery and difficulty. And so if you've ever felt like you don't understand or quite get the Trinity, don't feel bad. Neither did Nicodemus, a teacher of Israel, or as Clarence Jordan writes in the Cotton Patch Bible, the nation's foremost theologian. I figure if the Trinity was tough for him, it's okay for it to be tough for us. Perhaps what's most difficult about the Trinity is that it tries to make sense of another. In this case, it tries to make sense of God. But any time we try to make perfect sense of another, we quickly fall short. Because the other, no matter how close or well-known or how loved she is or he is, is fundamentally a mystery to be explored but never fully comprehended. Heck. Sometimes I feel that way about myself. So let's not get stuck thinking or trying to figure out the Trinity. Rather, let's accept that there's a lot of mystery that we may never fully understand, even while we unpack a bit of God's mystery with the hope that the mystery of the abiding relationship that is God. I'll say that one again. That we hope that the hope that the mystery of the abiding relationship that is God might help us to better understand who we can be and how we can be our best selves with one another. So, what does the Trinity reveal? Well, it doesn't reveal how God came to be God or even how God comes to be the Trinity. On the contrary, it simply reveals that God is, in a fundamental way, 
that is a basic way, relational. That at the very being of God is relationship. In this case, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To affirm the Trinity, God in three persons, unity in diversity, is to proclaim that God, even in God's self, is relational. That God does not exist in isolation, not even within the Godhead. And while this is a revelation about God, I think it's important to realize that it's true, too, about us. We exist in a fundamentally relational way. Our very being is formed in a fundamentally relational way. Our very being is formed in the most holy of relationships, not only between a man and a woman, but between humanity and God. We, each and every one of us, from the first Adam and the first Eve to the newest baby born here at St. John's or at, at Beaumont, each and every one of us came to being through another. Not only do we come to being through relationship, we are fundamentally dependent upon relationship. Our infancy, of course, but even our adulthood, our lives, especially our lives here in modern America, we exist through and in relationship. Not one of us, I dare say, not one of us would survive very well if we were left alone in America for but, a, I don't know, a day or two or three. We exist relational. Our individual existence is fundamentally dependent on the diversity and relationships that surround us and sustain us. And in God, the Holy Trinity, we begin to see what our, relationship can, our relationships can become. For in the Trinity, we see a mutuality of interdependence rooted in humility, generosity, and joy. First, each person Father, Son, and Spirit, Mother, Child, and Abiding Presence exist in a bond of interdependence. They relate to one another at all times. God the Father has the need of the Son and the Spirit. For the Father cannot reveal the depths of his love without the life of Jesus the Son. And God the Son does not proclaim his own word, but every word the Father has given to him while simultaneously recognizing that even he cannot fully convey the trust and love that God has for the disciples or for the world, apart from the Spirit. And the Spirit can do nothing apart from the Father or the Son from whom the Spirit proceeds. They are dependent upon one another. They are fundamentally interdependent in one another. And yet, the interdependence that we see, am I making sense so far? I pray I'm making a little bit of sense. And if I'm not, just tell me. <laughs> Otherwise, just take a nap, right? It's a tough one. So here we have this, the, the Trinity related to one another, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dependent upon one another. But they don't, that interdependence that they share is not, is not the foundation of their relationship. The foundation is found in humility, generosity, and joy that they share. Interdependence is the, is the result, but humility, generosity, and joy are the foundation. Humility. Consider this. The humility of God the Father that makes room for the Son and the Spirit within the very Godhead. And not only within the concept of God, but within the activity of God. God the Father doesn't do it all. God the Son has a responsibility. And the Spirit has a responsibility. And not only a responsibility, but a fundamental purpose and necessity. God the Father makes 
with such humility makes room for the Son and the Spirit. And not only in their activity, but also in the glory and honor of God. For we praise not just God the Father, but God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father lives with such humility that it's even possible for us to praise only God the Son. Or those who might only know and celebrate the Spirit in their lives. God the Father makes room for others, the Son and the Spirit, to be glorified. And yet, God the Father possesses the humility to create space for Son and Spirit within the glory and honor of God. And yet, we see this same humility in Jesus. Jesus, the Son, who seeks no glory for himself, but only and always the glory of the one who sent him, God the Father. And similarly, Jesus makes no claims for the full, upon, uh, for the fullness of God, willingly departing so that the Spirit, as we heard last week, last week, Jesus departing so that the Spirit may take its place in our lives and in the lives of the world. The mystery of the Trinity, the interdependence and mutuality we come to know, begins in their humility with one another. And if it begins in humility, it is built upon generosity. One might even say that humility is a unique form of generosity. For the generosity of honor for and within another. You see, the most readily we see this, the most re readily in the Gospel of John, in those wonderful and complex discourses between Jesus and in his prayers, we glimpse the generosity that flows from father to son and from son to father and onward. God the Father has given all things, authority and glory and honor, all things into the hands of Jesus, while Jesus is ever returning all things, all glory and honor, back to God persistently generous to one another. And while humility may be the foundation and generosity, the scaffolding upon which the Trinity is built, it is joy that binds them together. The joy of a father's only son. The joy of a son in his father. The joy, too, of seeing another flourish and become. It is a wonder to behold the unity and diversity of the Trinity to witness the interdependence rooted in humility, generosity, and joy. Perhaps it's even more wondrous to see the fruit of such relationship. For the relationship of God, not any one God, part or person of God, but the totality, the unity of God, does wondrous things. The mutuality of God pours itself pours itself in life for the world. From the first breath of, of life, yes, but also the restoration of all things, of all that is broken, to the beauty of diversity that we see all around us, to the brilliant flourishing of the human life and mind and spirit. These are the fruit of of the life-giving relationship that is God. Okay, so I've said a lot of he heady things, more than I meant to say, actually, when I set out to write this sermon. So what does all of this mean for us? Well, I invite you to look around us, and we will see all types of relationships. We will see good relationships, life-giving relationships. We will see destructive relationships, relationships that drain us. In fact, I suspect that most of the relationships we see, and perhaps even that we encounter, most relationships in our world are functional relationships. Two individuals 
who are seeking to acquire, if not overtly take, something from another. I dare say it is the way most of the world operates and interacts, perhaps even the way most of us interact within the world. But seldom are such relationships mutually rewarding and life-giving within themselves, let alone life-giving to others. So God, in God's wisdom, reveals another way of being. Mutual interdependence rooted in humility, generosity, and joy. A way of being that leads to mutual glory, mutual flourishing and blessing, and overflows even into the life of others. I suspect we've all had or been touched by such relationships within our lives, not just with God, but with others. A unique friend, a profound mentor, or a dearest love. Others who have approached us, who have approached you even, with humility and generosity and joy. As if their very joy depended not on their glory and success, but upon your flourishing upon your joy becoming complete. Remember those people and do something about it. I encourage you to set aside an extra hour or two in your life in this week to come. Just try it for a week where you pour yourself out for the sake of another where you pour yourself into another for their simple sake. Someone for whom you are willing to create just a bit of extra time, into whom you are willing to pour your love simply for their joy. Try that form of relationship. You see, God presents us another way of being a way that overflows with goodness, joy, and life. And God invites us to walk that life and that path, which is to live with humility, generosity, and joy for another. May we follow the path of God. Amen.